Greetings, Trombolus at Large. I am the Vagrant Trombone, and we are here today to talk to you about, well, you clicked on it, so you should already know, the Trombone Slide. The Trombone Slide makes up two-thirds of all the tubing on your trombone, in most cases, roughly. And you might be saying, two-thirds? It's only half the trombone. And then now you're thinking, well, of course, there is an inner slide and an outer slide. Now, since we already know what we're going to talk about, we may as well just get started, right? With the uh, trombone slide, we're going to have our mouthpiece. Now, our mouthpiece has lots of little bits and pieces and all kinds of terminologies that are used to identify its parts too, but I really want to just focus on the slide for today. So the only part of the mouthpiece we really need to be concerned with is the shank. So the shank of the mouthpiece goes into the lead pipe of the trombone, and in the lead pipe the mouthpiece sends the sound down into the lead pipe past the mounting bracket which holds the hand brace through the cork barrel and then past the turn section of the cork barrel, where the slide lock usually is, into the inner slide tube. The inner slide tube transfers the sand down through the slides, and then we get down to the end where we enter the flared stocking portion of the slide. We then come out the step of the slide into the overbore of the upper outer slide tube. We then come through the outer slide tube and go past the ferrule connection, which is the solder joint, which is both airtight and watertight, that holds the lower crook onto the slide, or the slide crook onto the slide. We come around the bow, we pass the dent guard, which usually has a bayonet or a button style tip on it to uh, support the trombone stand, and then we go past the vent hole, which is covered by the nipple, which is in turn sealed by the water key. We come around the bottom, we go past the lower fairing into the lower outer slide tube, we step up into the inner lower stocking, we travel up the true bore of the inner tube, of the inner uh, the lower inner slide tube. We come up past the connection for the lower brace and the lower cork barrel, and then we enter into the uh, male connector for the bell. Okay, the bell connector. Now, that's a lot of stuff to remember, and we're going to go over it once or twice. We're going to get a little more into detail, but one of the things to talk about right now is this is the area if you want to get the bore of your trombone, the bore diameter of your trombone, you can't get it up here because this is a standard size for all tenor shank mouthpieces or bass shank mouthpieces, depending on the uh, kind of mouthpiece you have for your horn. You can't get it on the outer slide because the outer slide is over bore. You can't get it on the di the outer dimension of the inner slide because you don't know the wall thickness of the tubing. And you can't get it at the end of the stocking because that's been flared out. The only really good place to get the bore size on a single bore slide is up here at the end where we can see that this horn is half an inch which is 500 bore. Now I don't want to get into all that kind of stuff so we'll just suffice it to say that you measure it in thousandths of an inch, so 0.500ths of an inch. So this is a 500 bore slide for my alto trombone. If I were to measure a different slide like this one, this one would be, you know, a 5, uh, 540 something or other, I don't remember. But what's important to note is that this is where you're going to be able to find your bore diameter. There's not really any other good place to measure it from on the instrument. Now, if you have a dual bore slide, the upper tube is going to be slightly narrower than the lower tube, thus dual bore, and uh, there, I don't really know a good way to get that diameter. Now, let's talk a little bit about, in detail, about these little bits and pieces that we've gone by. First of all, the mouthpiece on the stocking end goes into the lead pipe. 
It does not go into the receiver. Now, there are basically three different kinds of vernaculars or vocabularies that, we, that I have found people use to describe a trombone slide. And the reason why is because there's basically the educator version. And most music educators, they don't play trombone. They, they, the only time they played trombone was when they were in a brass class in college, and maybe they only played it for a couple of weeks. And so, it, so they don't really know all the parts. They may be a French horn player, or a trumpet player, or a mandolin player, or a kazoo player, or something, you know? Auto harp. They, <laughs> but they not, not necessarily a trombone player. And then there's the vernacular that trombonists use amongst each other to describe the bits and pieces of their trombone, whatever they've had working on, or broke, or whatever. And then there's the technical vocabulary, which is used by repairmen and instrument builders. Now, I don't know a lot of that vocabulary, and so what I'm going to simply do is try to use the most common versions of the vernacular that is most used, of the dialect of trombone, that we use to talk about trombone slides. And one of the things that I see a lot of is people calling this the receiver. This is not the receiver. Now, there are some trombones that do have receivers, but I'll just explain that in a minute. A receiver is actually a short piece of metal that holds the mouthpiece and the lead pipe, okay? The mouthpiece goes in one end, which is eccentrically ground, to fit the taper of the mouthpiece. And the lead pipe, as you can see, comes in from this direction and enters into the other end of the receiver. The receiver is typically soldered to a brace, which is then soldered to the horn. Sometimes the receiver is actually soldered directly to the horn, like on a tuba or euphonium. But the only instrument that does not really typically use a receiver is the trombone. The trombone is, <laughs> trombone or trombone, is unique for two reasons. It has a slide, and typically, I'll get to the other reason in a second. As we can see, the lead pipe tapers into the receiver, and the mouthpiece goes into the other end. And in between the mouthpiece and the top of the lead pipe is the gap. The evil gap. If you're a trumpet player, you may have spent many, many moments of your life pondering the gap. Now, fortunately for trombone players, the gap isn't as critical, or on euphonium or tuba or E-flat horn even. It's not as important. The gap doesn't really matter as much, but I'm kind of getting off the topic. So, in an attempt to wring out more information in a smaller amount of time, I'll try my best not to go off onto a tangent. Because when thinking about a slide, there's a lot of stuff we can actually talk about. So I was talking about the gap and the lead pipe. The other thing that makes the trombone unique is that the lead pipe is completely enshrouded inside of the upper slide tube. Now this is a removable lead pipe and it simply goes in here. Now on a removable lead pipe you can have a receiver but the receiver is not for the mouthpiece. The receiver is for the threaded collar soldered to the lead pipe which holds the lead pipe in. Some lead pipes are press fit. I used to have a press fit lead pipe for this but it died a terrible death when I dropped it on the floor and so now I just have the stock lead pipe for this horn. So the mouthpiece goes into the lead pipe. The lead pipe is soldered to the inside of the upper inner slide tube. The inner slide tube is then soldered to the cork barrels which support the main hand brace. This is the main hand brace. This is the slide brace. This is the slide hand brace. This is called the brace box. In this case it's not quite a box but that's what they refer to the brace box, where your hands go. And you might say, well, what about the brace on the belt? That's called the bell brace or the thumb brace. So this is the main hand brace. This is the slide brace. The trombone's inner slides are kind of odd because this part is actually on the outside of the outer slide and covers it up. But uh, I'll talk about a cork, the cork barrels in just a moment. It's the mouthpiece goes into the lead pipe, which is completely enshrouded within the instrument. It's the only brass instrument where the lead pipe is actually inside 
the instrument, as opposed to something like this, which is my flugelbone, where you can see the lead pipe tapers into the outside like a trumpet, or a French horn, or a tuba, or a euphonium, or any other kind of instrument. This instrument is readily identifiable by its characteristic three spit valves on the bottom of the flugelbone, but that's a topic for another time. So we have the inner tube, the inner upper slide tube, which is in turn soldered to the cork barrel, and the inner slide tube is typically it's made out of brass, but they have plated it with some kind of metal that is, oh, brass being a porous metal, is prone to corrosion. Now, corrosion is not good, so they typically will plate the inner slide tubes with some other kind of metal. Um, in this case, it could be a chrome or maybe a zinc of some kind. And then we come down to the cork barrel. Now, the, the uh, not the cork barrel, excuse me, cork barrel. This is the stocking end of the trombone slide. Now, in the old days, the stocking was actually, it's called the stocking because it was actually a sleeve of metal that fit a stocking over the inner slide tube. And that's an interesting piece of tech that we'll get to in a minute. But the reason why we have cork barrels on our horn is because on ancient horns, on the sack butt or the poussin, as they were called, I've seen these instruments are not, I've seen pictures of the original instruments. I've never actually seen an original. And remakes or, or remanufactured versions of those ancient instruments, they'll have on the slide tube, the top will be really long, and then the bottom just will end right here, right there. And the reason why was so that your hand could rest on the lower slide, inner slide tube, and the slide would not be slicing you up. And the top tube would be really long, and it would just bump right into the hand stock. The problem with that is clank, clank, clank. So they would try to cover it with something like fabric or cork, but because it was unsupported, it would just disintegrate and fall apart. And, and they discovered by putting on these cork barrels, they could pack cork inside of them, and then we get nice boom, 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 instead of clank, clank, clank. And they put one on the bottom because when they lengthened this tube, it would be like a cheese slicer, you know, just taken off little pieces of uh, bologna from the bottom of your hand to make a sandwich for lunch. Don't want that to happen. So that's why we have cork barrels on our horns, is to protect our hands and support the instrument. It also creates a better place to support the slides, which the inner slide tubes, which are prone to getting out of adjustment if they are not properly supported. So the inner slide tubes are plated with some kind of harder metal. When we get to the stocking end, as I said, this is a sleeve that goes on. Now the reason why that sleeve is on there is because if it weren't, and we were to try to draw the slide up, down here we would have plenty of ease with friction. It wouldn't be a problem. But as you increase the amount of uh, surface area making contact with that inner slide tube, you would be, the outer slide tube, you would be getting a lot of friction and by the time you got to the top you would not be able to move that slide very well so the people who created the trombone slide which goes all the way back to the uh, Middle East or some part of Asia they discovered that if they put a larger piece of stocking over the inner slide tube they could create an airspace and create a consistent friction zone between outer slides and inner slides that would allow uniform friction with the slide. In a perfect world, this is the only place where the slide, outer slide, should make contact with the tube. Now, of course, there's going to be a little play because this is not a perfect world, but that's the theory. And this is also a very interesting piece of tech because, like I said, there's so much we could discuss because the trombone slides, unlike valves, don't ride on a, on a thin layer of oil. They ride on a bead of water. And the way that water, now you might be looking at the slide and saying, this is yellow brass, and this is plated. Well, if the yellow brass on the outer slide is porous, why doesn't it have a problem with corrosion? Because it's in constant contact, or when it passes over the friction zone of the stocking, it keeps the slide polished and on the inside, as well as the cream uh, treating the inside of the bore of the 
outer slide tube, which seasons the bore so that it will repel water. And the water, because of the moisture in our breath, this tube gets warm as we play. This tube cools as we play, which creates beads of water in between the two tubes. And that is what the slide actually functions on. Now I'm getting off topic, so let's just continue on, shall we? In the old horns, now I said this is a flared tube. In the old horns, they used to just put a stocking on here and solder it on. The problem was moisture would get between the gap of the two pieces of metal and cause corrosion from inside, and the tube would either slip off or it would become loose or it could uh, just stop working. And it was also very heavy. So what they started doing was drawing tubes that were thicker and then narrowing down. But because of manufacturing processes, this isn't an efficient way to make a slide tube. It's much easier to make a really long tube, cut it to length, and then flare the end that is going to be where the stocking goes. So in the interests of manufacture, they actually did us a favor by creating a step inside of here where the air can flow down without creating as much turbulence when it leaves the step of the upper inner slide tube and enters the overbore section of the outer slide tube. The reason why it's considered overbore is because it's not one tubing larger than the inner tube. It's actually two because of the stocking. Okay, So we enter the we we exit the end of the inner slide tube and we go through the ferrule. <clears throat> we have the crook. The crook, there are three different basic forms of crook. There's a modified crook. That's This is a modified crook. There's a square crook, like on this Bach trombone. And then there are uh, rather very round ones, like on king trombones. And I mentioned that some trombones have a receiver. On some Bach trombones that have removable lead pipes, you might get a little tiny piece that really just holds the mouthpiece. That's the receiver for the mouthpiece, and it usually screws on or has a clamp that holds it in place. Some European trombones, like the ones I used to play when I was living in France, they don't have lead pipes, and it they have a receiver. And it makes the horn kind of squirrely to play. Uh, I prefer... A lead pipe and <laughs> it just makes the horn sound better but what I was getting to is that in some older king trombones the lead pipe actually does go into a receiver and you can look into the top of the mouthpiece or where the uh, where the top of the receiver is and you can see the uh, lead pipe in there you can see the lead pipe at the bottom and there is a gap between the end of the mouthpiece and the lead pipe the lead pipe is hopefully the exact same diameter as the end of the mouthpiece and there's a small gap in between them. With a trombone lead pipe it just presses in and then it steps out and goes into the venturi, travels out. But again a lot of words, a lot of more things we don't want to talk about. So we come into the slide and we were talking about the crook. The crook has a vent hole on the inside. The nipple on the outside is soldered to the over the vent hole with a flat face on it to allow the cork to get a better seat on the water key. Now, water keys are another topic too. We won't keep talking about those. So, we come up the lower tube. We enter the lower cork barrel. Come out of here. And we go into the bell section, which has all of its little bits and pieces too. Now, as you can see, the outer slides typically are made out of yellow brass. This is more of a standard looking kind of slide. It has these sleeves on it which support the slide brace as opposed to the hand brace which is supported by the cork barrels. Now the reason why these sleeves are there is because these walls on brass, brass being a soft metal, uh, add structural integrity to the slide to keep it from getting torqued or out of alignment, which can happen. Now if you see some lightweight slides, most trombones with lightweight slides, they'll have nickel-silver tubes. And the reason why is because nickel-silver is a harder metal. That's the reason why nickel-silver is also preferred for the main hand brace and connections, because it's a harder metal. It is less, it is more resistant to bending and you're less likely to have trouble with it as it ages too because being a harder metal it's not going to corrode as 
quickly as would yellow brass. Now you're looking at this slide and saying, well, why doesn't this slide, this is being a lightweight slide, doesn't have sleeves on it. This is not necessarily a professional trombone, this is a pretty cheap trombone, but um, the reason why it doesn't have them is just for convenience and lightness of the slide. Heavier metal, more metal on your horn makes your slide heavier. So lightweight slides are made out of a heavier metal, but because the metal has more structural integrity, they can grind the the uh, they can grind the tube wall to be thinner, so that you actually have a weight savings over the thickness that the tube has to be to provide safe integrity for a yellow brass tube. Now, crooks come in all different kinds of things, and like I said, we could go on and on about this. It could go on for quite some time. So, instead of doing that, we'll just uh, call it a day on this one. And I had the reason for doing this video is someone made a comment on my slide lock video, which I made ages ago, and I finally got around to making that, making that uh, video about other parts of the slide. Now, Another reason why I made the slide video is because I had a new student, an elementary student, and one of the first questions I always ask my students is, what do you do? What's the first thing you do when you take out your trombone and put it together? And he said, well, I open the case, and I get out the thingy, and I take that thingy, and I put it in this thingy, and then I, like, do this with this thingy, and then I take the other thingy, and I put it on that thingy, and I slide them together, and then I screw the screw thingy on, and then I've got a trombone. And I thought, let's, uh, let's break that down to uh, a little more complex vocabulary. We're going to learn a whole new language. So that was another driving motivation for this, as well as seeing uh, videos where people were referring to this as the receiver. And again, it's not a receiver, it's the lead pipe. Some horns do have receivers, and I myself refer to this as a receiver once in a while with my students because their teachers have called it that, and it's in the interests of making things go smoothly and not having any complications. It just seems easier to kind of stick with the program. And so we do what we have to do, but if we can learn new words, it's always a good thing. Ah, 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 ah.